Islam rose again after this period, didn't have science associated with it. No new inventions in math. You look at the period of Islam in Spain, the period where the great Alhambra was built. There is no attendant science going on there. It's done. It's gone. This is now going to be in the public sphere for people to ridicule you and to remind you of your incompetence. Every time they see your face, they'll be reminded of your academic incompetence on these fields. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you guys doing? So I came across a clip by a new atheist academic called Neil deGrasse. Now this individual is put forward in a lot of the kind of debates and public discussions and he gets millions of views and he represents the kind of new atheism from as much as I can um, understand from his polemics. And really when I watched this clip, I thought to myself, should I dignify? Should I dignify these comments with a response? And I, at the end of it, I said I have to because this is such a ridiculous showing of academic incompetence that I thought it must be answered. So let's take a look at this clip and dissect it piece by piece. At this point, Islam is maybe just a few hundred years old. So the first thing he says, he says Islam is just a few hundred years old. Now, I don't know how he defines a few, but at the time of Al-Ghazali, Islam is around 500 years, which is half a, mil half a millennium. So this is already showing you says, precursors to the bigger errors that are going to come. People are reading the Quran and interpreting it however they sort of want to and feel like it. There's not a coherence to the practice of Islam until he comes around. He says something here which I don't understand what he means by it because he says it's, before Ghazali there was no coherence to the practice of Islam. Now I don't understand what he means by this because from a jurisprudential perspective the four imma or the four imams, major imams of Sunni Islam and by the way also the major branch of Shia Islam were all established. I mean you had um, you know the four madhahib, you had usul fiqh being established by the book of a shafi'i who wrote a risala one of the most uh, early commentaries or um, explications of asul fiqh or the principles of uh, jurisprudence. You had the codification of all of the major hadith books, including Bukhari and Muslim and so on. So I don't really understand what he means by, by the fact that there was no coherence to the practice of Islam, especially because Al-Ghazali himself was positioned or was from the school of thought of the Shafi'is and he was from the school of thought from Aqidah perspective of the Ash'aris. So he was part of the discourse, but he was not in any way, um, you know, making his own school of thought. I mean, there were the practices that were already codified from a jurisprudential and creedal and hadith perspective. So I don't understand really what he meant by this, but let's go on and see what he says next. People are reading the Quran and interpreting it however they sort of want to and feel like it. There's not a coherence to the practice of Islam until he comes around. Now he says that, Muslims were interpreting the Quran in whatever way they wanted to. But this is false because there were principles of istimbat, uh, as is mentioned in the Quran. You know, لَعَلِمَهُ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَنْبِطُونَهُ مِنْهُمْ As the Quran says, the, the, uh, those who are able to do extrapolation would be able to do so. And this extrapolation is a method, right? So it's called, um, you know, tafsir method or the exegetical method. This was already laid down well before you know, uh, Al-Ghazali, Al-Tabari had his uh, magnum opus or his uh, compendious or voluminous or encyclopedic uh, tafsir. And this was well known and, and many other tafsir or exegetical works were made thereafter. So this idea that people were haphazardly, haphazardly, you know, interpreting the Quran in the way that they wanted to is far from the theological truth. And this shows that this man is weak academically in his presentation. And codifies the behavior of a good Muslim. In much the same way St. Augustine, in his book, Cities of God, codified what it is to be a good Christian. And he says that Augustine codified what it is to be a good Christian, as if he was, you know, in the, uh, in the fifth century as he came along, he was the one who did so, and there was not a patristic uh, backdrop to his uh, existence. I mean, uh, many of the church fathers uh, predated Augustine by hundreds of years. I mean, you have Justin Martyr, you have uh, Origin of Alexandra, you have all of these uh, big names, and you have the so-called ecumenical councils, that, you know, Chalcedon and, and Nicaea and all of these things. I mean, was, was there not a Christian community before Augustine came along? 
Uh, this shows you that his patristic understanding or understanding of patristic scholarship is as weak or even probably weaker than his historical knowledge and or theological knowledge as it relates to Islam. So let's go on. The assertion that the manipulation of numbers is the work of the devil. All right, so here he makes this big claim. He says that Al-Ghazali mentions that uh, it's the manipulation of numbers are the work of the devil. As assuming or presupposing that Al-Ghazali, of all people he could have chosen, and this is ridiculous, because Al-Ghazali, of all the, for anyone who knows just a little bit of either the philosophy of religion or intellectual history, they would know who Al-Ghazali is. For all the people in the Islamic world you've decided to choose, you chose Al-Ghazali to say that he was against science and mathematics, and what's worse is that the quote that he mentioned is nowhere to be found in his compendious works. The closest thing I found was something in his Ahya uh, Ulum al-Din, which is a book, a huge book, uh, made many vo volumes, voluminous. And in, uh, in his uh, Kitab al-Ilm, he mentions that people who go far in excesses when it comes to not just mathematics, but in other, other fields, in kalam and otherwise, that they would be damaging themselves. But he actually mentions in the same book, by the way, this book is translated into English. And you can pick up an English translation by Kenneth uh, Honekamp. And you'll find in page 38 that Al-Ghazali says the opposite of what you're saying that he said. Al-Ghazali mentions that it's fard kifaya that it's a communal obligation for people to learn the praised sciences, as he calls them, of medicine and of mathematics. You see, this is the distortion that the new atheists have to resort to in order to try and attack religious narratives. Absolute distortions, and they should be ashamed of themselves that they're coming forward and speaking in this way without the academic competence, the academic competence of checking their work. I mean, if this was done in another context with other fields, they would be all over us and attacking us. But this is historical information which has been distorted. And how dare you mention Al-Ghazali of all the scholars you could have mentioned. An individual who had a method which was systematic. And if you really look at René Descartes, who was the father of rationalism in the West, and his book, The Meditations, where he went through systematic doubt in order to, to come to cogito uh, ergo sum, which is, I think, therefore I am. You'll realize that in al Muqid Min al-Dalal and, uh, and the books of Tahafat al-Falasifa and all of those books, that the same method of systematic doubt, well before René Descartes came along with it, was exhibited and presented by the works of Al-Ghazali where he done exactly the same thing, a systematic doubt, a skeptical approach, and then the Kalam method and the arguments from Kalam, which are all over the academic uh, world now, uh, popularized by the likes of William Lane Craig and others in atheist discussions, were taken from Al-Ghazali. Why, if he is somebody who is uh, averse to the logical process or averse to mathematics or averse to uh, uh, medicine and science. In his book, Al Mustasfa, which is one of the most elaborative books on the topic of the principles of jurisprudence, he starts this book with a discussion on epistemology. And he started a tradition of doing that, such that even Hanabila, who were more conservative and reserved, especially when it came to Kalam, the systematic theo theology, someone like Ibn Qudama, in his book, in his Usul book, which, he, uh, which, he, which was really a, a copy or a, of a template of uh, Al-Ghazali, he also did the same thing in the first manuscript that you find. So he started a tradition of a discussion about epistemology and about uh, these philosophical matters. How dare you attribute to him, of all people in the Muslim world, that he was averse to and against science, mathematics, and technology. You should be ashamed of yourself. And this is, you, actually, you should come out and apologize. You should come out and apologize to the Muslim community and to the academic community, not just the Muslim, to the academic community for distorting the his, his intellectual history of the medieval period in such a way. You should come out and apologize. I want to see an apology on your Twitter or whatever it is you use. Yes. 
Because how dare you come out and lie flagrantly, blatantly, and obviously lie about something which you didn't have the common decency to double check. You make me sick. You make me sick. And this is what the new atheist movement has to resort to. Flagrant and obvious lies in order to distort the public narrative and to try and bring people away from religion. You have failed and you should be ashamed of yourself. Two, actions that you see in nature are the will of Allah. Well, if you drop a stone and it falls, not Allah willed that. He's talking about philosophy. And then he makes a bigger blunder. He says, you see, all the actions are from the will of Allah. And here he's referring to occasionalism. Occasionalism, which is a, an Ash'ari doctrine. And by the way, Ghazali, if you really read his books, he didn't believe in it in as much the same way as many of his predecessors did, uh, did uh, as many of the uh, scholars, even in the, in the West now, uh, have, have, have spoken about. He believed in a second order causation. But anyway, this is aside the point, you wouldn't even understand what I'm talking about. What is important here? Because you, you, you're a fool, with all due respect, and you're ignorant of these things. So you, I've got to speak, and you're not going to understand. But what you should know is, what's really funny and ironic is, people that you have had interviews with on this topic of determinism and free will, like Sam Harris, who brought, wrote a book called Free Will, believe in determinism. And so they don't believe. So you're saying here the will of God. So this stops curiosity and stops our uh, kind of motivation or disincentivizes us from doing things. If that's your explanation, your curiosity stops. But a determinist, even if they're an atheist who believes in an uninterrupted causal chain, will have exactly the same philosophical baggage. So when you are seated in front of your friend, Sam Harris who wrote a book called Free Will, and he wrote at the bottom of it, Sam Harris, but actually he should have wrote, he shouldn't have put his name there because it wasn't Sam Harris with his free will that wrote that book, but it was a set of uh, determined, uninterrupted uh, events, caused events that wrote that book. You should have inquired about that, about why could it be the case, or could it be the case that a deterministic worldview will interrupt someone's incentive to do things because otherwise everyone's a puppet everyone's doing things without uh, free will so if you're arguing that this disincentivizes people from or, or makes them less curious from doing things like science then this argument can be made on the world view of determinism uh, you see you've shot yourself in the foot because of your lack of knowledge not just in theology and history but also in philosophy the philosophy of religion and other other than that so you should be ashamed of yourself once again and you're embarrassing yourself you are absolutely embarrassing yourself. The more you talk, the more you make blunders. And you're getting caught out. And no longer is the Muslim community or even any religious community are going to sit idly by watching individuals like you talk rubbish and make mistakes and blunders and, and just leave you to do what you want to do. And maybe some of our youth will listen to what you have to say and be convinced. No, we're going to hold you to account, to academic account. Not just on a peer-reviewed journal that only a, f uh, a few elites can, can, uh, can look at. No, this is now going to be in the public sphere for people to ridicule you and to remind you of your incompetence. Every time they see your face, they'll be reminded of your academic incompetence on these fields. Islam rose again after this period. Didn't have science associated with it. And look at this claim that he makes. He says, Islam rose again after this period. But I didn't have science. Oh my God. Now you've just now you've humiliated yourself with all due respect to you that you don't actually deserve. You've humiliated yourself. How have you humiliated yourself? You've humiliated yourself. Completely humiliated yourself. So let me give you a few, a few names. Ibn Nafis. When did he die? Ibn Nafis, one of the greatest figures of the medieval period and in the Arab uh, world, in the Islamic period. 1213. 1213. This is how many years after Al Ghazali died? Maybe about 200 years. In fact, exactly 202 years. Yes? Or 102 years. So what? The, Ibn Nafis was not, uh, he was uh, brainwashed by Al Ghazali. Somehow, the works of Al Ghazali stopped everyone from doing science. Does this even sound rational to you? I mean, your irrationality, your new atheist irrationality is so limited. 
that you can't even understand, oh, one book, is it really going to change the way everyone operates in the entire Islamic period? Ibn Nafis, when did he die? I mean, didn't you even want to dignify yourself by checking these things up? I mean, some of the contemporaries of Al-Ghazali were doing mathematics. Amr Khayyam. He died uh, like a couple, of, a couple of dozen years after. He died some years after Al-Ghazali. I mean, oh, he was a mathematician. Oh, why didn't he stop doing maths? I mean, this is ridiculous. Al-Adrisi. What about Al-Adrisi, the geographer? Wait a minute. What about a Tosi? A Tosi who Copernicus references. Yes, he references in his book. And obviously Copernicus, you know, is the figurehead of the scientific revolution in the 16th century. And though al Batani is the only Islamic astronomer Copernicus actually names, recent detective work has uncovered clues that Copernicus based many of his ideas on the work of other Islamic scholars. The clearest example is Copernicus's use of a mathematical idea devised by the 13th century Islamic astronomer al Tusi. You have never read the works of Copernicus, because if you did, you'd know it's not just a Tulsi that he references, but he also references Ali Kushji. Now, Ali Kushji was an Ottoman into the 15th or, for, uh, 15th or 16th century, well after Al-Ghazali. He was an Ottoman, but he was instrumental. He was absolutely instrumental in influencing the Copernican revolution or the scientific revolution which is probably the biggest paradigm shift to use the term of uh, Thomas Kuhn that the western world has ever had in terms of scientific enterprise only to be compared possibly with the, the movement from Newtonian to Einsteinian physics how dare you stand in front of people and teach them false information how dare you do that how dare you stand there and say the things that you've said without even having the dignity and the self-respect of checking those things out. And look what he says after that. He says, there's 1.3 billion Muslims. Let's take a look. He says, there's 1.3 billion Muslims and how many Muslims won the Nobel Prize? And he says, he calls this the best measure. There is 1.3 billion Muslims in the world today who are not participants on the frontier of scientific discovery. What's the best measure of this? Just check out the Nobel Prizes. I tallied them, okay? How many Jews have won the Nobel Prize? In the sciences, here they go. <laughs> the best measure. Wait a minute. So he's, he, the argument here is that something inherently in Islam because of Al-Ghazali, so in other words, everyone, every Muslim now is influenced by Al-Ghazali's thought, even the Shi'is or even the, the Hanabila who are not influenced by him or other, uh, other madhahib or other people. Everyone's influenced by Al-Ghazali and Al-Ghazali has influenced them to, uh, to drop uh, science and technology and mathematics. And so everyone, because they, they needed Al-Ghazali to tell them that, they dropped, everyone dropped science and technology, even though, even though Samarkand, which had the, one of the biggest uh, and most influential observatories of the Muslim world uh, was actually established some centuries after Al-Ghazali's death. Even, I mean, I'm shocked as a physicist that you don't know about the, the history of uh, physics. You're an ignorant person. And now you're making the claim that of 1.3 billion, actually this must be a, an old statistic because there's way more than 1.3 billion according to Pew, another mistake. 1.3 8 billion, let's say, Muslims in the world. And he says, look how many people won Nobel Prizes. Well, okay, let me ask you a question. How many black people have won Nobel Prizes? Let me ask you a question. How many black people? Now, if I say that to you and you say, well, that's because of poverty and slavery and all of those things and colonialism, okay, all of those excuses can be <laughs> afforded to the Muslim world, most, m much of which have been colonized, uh, especially after the Ottoman fall. So uh, uh, disenfranchisement and poverty and all those things and... Uh, yeah, I mean, you can make the same excuses. And then he compares us with Jewish people, which is a false comparison. I don't know why he does that, because obviously... And the Nobel Prize, I mean, let's be honest. The Nobel Prize, and this is this just shows me how much of an Uncle Tom you are, with all due respect. Yes, because you respect the white man so much that when the white man 
and his institutions, they decide who wins the Nobel Prize because it's obviously ideologically linked, right? It's to the Western post-enlightenment experience. They decide who wins Nobel Prizes. You think that's somehow a measure of objective scientific um, uh, discovery and enterprise and so on? And that's why you could never, ever debate a Muslim who knows just a little bit of Islam and a little bit of history. You would never step forward and put yourself, your, your neck on the academic chopping board because you know what would happen. What would happen is the people would see an intellectual decapitation. So you roll back into the hole that you came from and if you don't offer the apology, then you've got to live with the humiliation. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.